Okay, wonderful. Uh, welcome to the Goethe Institute. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear friends, liebe Gäste, my name is Uwe Rau. I'm the director here at the Goethe Institute in Toronto. June is Pride Month, and this year we are celebrating in grand style with a program called Queer as German Folk, Stonewall 5.0. Queer as German Folk takes the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall riots in New York as an opportunity to outline the current state of discourse on queer emancipation against the backdrop of the last 50 years. As a regional project in North America, it puts a special spotlight on the trans transatlantic dialogue between civil society, LGBTIQ actors. But it is also about adjusting historical perspectives. The Goethe Institute Montreal, Toronto, Chicago, New York, Washington, San Francisco, and Mexico City are participating in this project. The exhibition, uh, developed by the Schwules, the Gay Museum in Berlin, focuses on the impact of Stonewall on what happened in Germany, also tapping into under-researched traditions, an example, the trans movement. Historical documents and archives are redefined as present-day objects by reproducing them on unusual media, such as T-shirts, highlighting the experiential and activist character of these movements. We see a little bit of the exhibit just here. Uh, the core exhibition is shown uh, until this Sunday at Toronto's new stacked container market at the corner of uh, Bathurst and Front. Uh, alongside this ancillary presentation here at our premises, which you hopefully can enjoy later. It is presented in partnership with Stacked and the archives who added new Toronto research to this project. At the same time as the exhibitions, the Goethe Institute hosts public panels on four different aspects of the current discourse on gender, queerness, and sexuality, with one representative from each of the four participating countries under the motto, Queer Commons, Queer Conflicts. Uh, and you might have seen that on our website uh, and, and on the information we send out through Facebook and other media. Uh, the topic for today in Toronto is queer culture. Uh, you will find a little handout on your seats with information on our four panelists and on the moderator. For decades, if not centuries, queer culture was counterculture. The fact that it has repeatedly provided influential impulses for mainstream culture from its enclaves in the cultural periphery has been widely studied, analyzed, and interpreted. Mostly this occurred in epochs of aesthetic reorientation, for example, mannerism, the fin de siècle, the roaring 20s, American pop culture of the 60s and, and the 70s. But the queer origins of the new currents were often veiled. With the advancing acceptance of queer ways of life, at least in urban communities, queer artistic and cultural positions increasingly lose their resistant character and are perceived as part of the mainstream what queer positions can be identified in art and culture? Where does queer, con queer contradiction manifest itself in the cultural sector? Is there even such a thing as queer culture? And what exactly can the term mean the self-definition of way of life of artists, subjects that can be, in be interpreted as queer or a specific critical queering manner of artistic or cultural production? Last but not least, do we still need these positions and production methods? Before I extend a warm welcome to all our guests, uh, Ivan Acebo from Mexico, Luane Glass, aka Dream Crusher from New York, Peter Rehberg from Berlin, behind me, and Al Flanders from uh, Toronto, I would like to thank my dear, and Michael Venus from Montreal, and he is actually the, I have to say that right now, he is actually the really nice person who inspired us uh, for the exhibit in Toronto and do it at Stack Container Market and was uh, very helpful in, in, uh, in creating these contacts. So we talked so much today, you're part of uh, my life now. <laughs> so, yeah, bef thank you to all of the panelists. Uh, but before we starting, I also would uh, like to thank my very dear colleagues here at the Institute, which is Jutta Brendemühl, Pari Ludin, just in front of me, Anja Bresemann, and our intern Marisa Uphoff, who is not here today. Um, 
who worked really around the clock to make this project happen. I wish all of us a pleasant and stimulating afternoon and we'll hand it over directly to Al Flanders. Thank you. A very nice afternoon. Einen schönen Nachmittag. Vielen Dank. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming on such a beautiful day. Finally, we're here. Um, I think summer is upon us, and I always remember every Pride weekend um, was the the sun always came out on Pride somehow. Um, so hopefully it will remain as such, um, despite the fact that I didn't know it was Pride weekend until two days ago. Uh, but we can talk about that. <laughs> Why do I not know? <laughs> Uh, so let us begin our query. Um, you all have uh, people's bios, and what we didn't want to do was run through the biography of everybody, so please catch up if you haven't already. Um, I will start with Dream Crusher on the outside. Can I call you Dream Crusher? <laughs> um, oh, oh, Luane? Oh. Um, <laughs> um, you can call me Luane, Lou, all right. Lou or Cindy, or no. Dandelion, I don't know. Cindy Lou? Sure. <laughs> Cindy Lou. I like that. I like Cindy Lou. Okay. Dream um, Crusher, a.k.a. Cindy Lou. We'll hi. start. Oh, oh. Um, so we're going to work our way across. We have a terrific international group here who have been involved in all sorts of things queer related, but really outside of the mainstream. And I think that's kind of what we want to talk about today is sort of, you know, what is the alternative space still for queer? Can it uh, can it be that alternative space? Um, and what does that mean anymore? Uh, and I guess I'd love to start here, and maybe you could tell us a little bit um, about what kind of queer platforms that you use to create this kind of world um, that manifests a queer world and why. Huh. Um, it's, that's it's kind of an interesting question because, like, um, the, one of the more recent Instagram posts I made uh, was about, um, I've been an active musician and artist um, for like almost 20 years. And I think this this is like the only like sponsored queer thing I've ever done. <laughs> Are we <laughs> like, sponsored? Yeah. Are we sponsored? It's, oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, kind of like, you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> institutional, that yeah. Um, but I think it's because... And I said this on social media, I think it's because like, I'm not trying to be accepted by straight people. And I feel like a lot of sponsored pride events, it's like, look, we're, we're just like you. It's okay. Like, accept us. And I don't really, I don't, I just do my thing. I don't necessarily like, you know what I'm saying? I'm not wanting a handout from people that only want something from me because they, because I'm providing a thing. Not necessarily like, they don't accept my existence. They mm -hmm. accept the thing that I do. So like, beeping. Um, you know what I mean? Um, but it's really interesting. I'm from the, I'm from middle America originally and I'm really lucky to live in New York where there are so many, still so many like, not not even necessarily overlapping, but there are just a lot of a lot of queer collectives musically and artistically that exist in New York. And um because I don't necessarily affiliate with a certain type of person or a certain type of label or management group or anything like that, I'm able to like perform in a bunch of different areas and and still stick out and that type of thing. And um that's a gift and a curse to a certain degree. But um uh yeah, it's really it's really nice that like I'm not like accepted by them, but I'm accepted by us. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So um, that's kind of how I operate within things. Can you talk a little bit about the music and music as a platform for kind of queer expression for you? Um, for me, um, I always say that my music is, is inherently like socially conscious and political because I exist in this shit world and I have to like, cope with how it treats me and cope with where it puts me and that type of thing it's it's not by choice like I don't I don't set out to really discuss my identity or 
like being trans or being non-binary or any of that stuff like it just kind of happens because i exist in this body and i would like people to respect that mm. <laughs> but you know what i mean like i don't really like i don't i don't wave the p flag everywhere because i kind of don't have to um <laughs> uh specifically when i play like it's really hard for me to wear clothes like this because I have to, I feel like I have to get into my, my mode and in order to do that, I like a lot. Of, I used to wear a lot of my sister's clothes. Like she doesn't actually know this. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry Bella, Carrie, and Roxy. I went, I, I went through all your closet, honey. You got some cute stuff. I could fit it. I took it. So what? Like, what's good? Like, what's up? But it's it's like it's a form of armor. So I just put I put like whatever gets me in the mode um, on, and that helps me interact with the crowd. And when I'm learning as I play more to more diverse audiences, it's really it's becoming easier for queer people to identify with me because my music and the way I express myself is so harsh and uncompromising and physical and confrontational. Um, I'm really happy about that because. I feel like the mainstream kind of puts on a very specific visual for queer people that they feel like they have to adhere to. And that is really detrimental. And it's really nice that as as little as my platform is that I'm able to like like give other options to people, I guess. So I don't know if I answered your question at all. <laughs> I think you probably did. We'll try and get back to, we'll come around again, um, but let's uh, let's shelve, I, I'd like to talk about the idea of confrontational, but I'll kind of bring that, uh, we'll come back to that, but kind of want to keep on going down the panel line here. Um, and maybe you could tell us a little bit about what you do now, because I know you've just taken over the running of the uh, gay museum. And I say gay because you're going to have to contend with that problem, because that's what you're called. Um, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I don't quite run <laughs> in it. In Berlin. But I'm, <laughs> but I'm head of, uh, we're an organization, so we have a board, uh, and the members of the board are running the museum, but um, I am one of the uh, three department heads, and I'm running the um, collection and archives at Schmudis Museum. That's what I'm responsible for. I've been doing this for a year now. And since you were asking about platforms, um, the Schwules Museum is certainly a platform. Um, we have about, say, three sections that are the pillars of the institution. One is the archive. Um, there's a lot to be said about the archive. Can you just tell us how far back the Schwules Museum goes? Yeah, when I mean, it the Schwules Museum uh, emerged in 1984 when a group of students, gay, gay male students in Berlin, um, were working at the Märkisches Museum, so this was pre-unification, and came up with the idea of, um, at the Berlin, Berlin uh, Museum, which is now Märkisches Museum, came up with the idea of a gay and lesbian art show. Um, and they convinced the director of the museum to do so. Uh, the show was called El Dorado, and was realized in 1985. It has a, had a lesbian track and a gay track, and they were completely separated spatially. That's how it was. Uh, so uh, I cannot really reconstruct the conflicts of that time and the politics, but there was a spirit of uh, a separatist spirit. So after that um, exhibition, a gay museum was founded, but not a gay and lesbian museum. So historically, we have been for 35 years a gay museum, but uh, at least for the past 10 years or so, we understand ourselves as queer in an inclusive way. We are still called Schwules Museum. Um, we discussed this briefly, you know, the pros and cons of naming an institution in the German context queer or schwul. Um, schwul has, you know, a handicap of limiting it to a certain, or privileging a certain group, or making a certain group more visible than others, for sure. On the other hand, queer in the German context is a very strange term, uh, very different from the, uh, the English-speaking context, because it's so abstract. I mean, in fact, um, <laughs> I'd say in Germany, no one really knows what queer is, you know? It's become this empty signifier or another buzzword for being hip, and it's very, very subject to all kinds of appropriations, right? So it's a, it's a tough choice. So on the one hand, you want to be queer in an inclusive and critical way. On the other hand, uh, the question is, is that the best term in the German language um, to name a queer project? Because the history, say, of, uh, of shame, of discrimination, um, that is attached to, and transgression, that's attached to queer in English, it's not attached to queer in German at all. Yeah. Well, we could cancel the panel and suggest <laughs> that queer isn't alternative, but. 
<laughs> or we could debate. <laughs> I mean, we, we have a debate about this in the museum. You know, there's folks that really want to rename the museum as queer and think Schwul is too, too 80s and uh, let's get rid of that. But um, there's also something to be said for the dirtiness of Schwul in a certain sense. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think what what I'd like to talk about and think about more so um, when we open it up for questions too, the idea of appropriation, not the idea, the reality of appropriation, how it affects the community, but also yeah. what are some of the things that we can do to actually push back? Is it important to push back? If so, I mean, imagine we're here for that very reason. Yeah. Um, what does that mean in terms of, you know, uh, wh why that exists, why yeah. there is that need for conflict and for push back in terms of, notice I keep doing this with my arms, yes. as sort of yes. making space. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, so let's move then, let's go, let's continue with language, um, because Ivan, you're very involved with, uh, you're moving between Mexico and, uh, and Canada often, mm -hmm. um, in terms of the cultural community. Uh, we had a brief discussion earlier about the same idea of sort of what what queer working and not working within a Mexican context mm -hmm. um, and how in that culture, you know, it doesn't necessarily have the same connotations. And I thought maybe we could talk about that, but maybe you could just introduce your sort of work in terms of books and what you're doing around publications. Right. But, but, but I think that I can actually sort of answer that question because um, if I go back to your to, to the very first one that you said, it was you know like what's your platform, and um, and I mean my re like I arrived to queer theory or to the study of you know queerness through a PhD, um, and which I did in I mean I did like a college like a BA in the United States, and then I moved to Mexico and did a master's, and then I went to Cuba to do also some like queer theory work. And um, and at, at first, I, th I thought of like academia and research as the platform that would allow me to sort of like investigate further this problem of queerness in Latin America. But then I realized that uh, like the academic centers in Mexico were also kind of like being normalized and also being sort of like very affected by this idea of Sort of like corporate and banalization and all of that. And so I got a little bit disappointed with that. And then I started doing my own thing. Um, like I curated a couple of shows and then I started doing like doing some um, like work with my own dissertation and research. And, and, and then I entered the institutional um, area of work because I was working for the Canadian government in Mexico. And then right now I'm, I just moved to Ottawa um, for like, I don't know, six months ago. And that's how I work with uh, publications, with uh, Canadian publishers. So what we do is, uh, you know, not necessarily from a queer point of view, but you know, but what we do is sort of, sort of like try to make sure that Canadian publishers have um, like, a, like a strong voice abroad, you know, it's kind of like strengthen their presence abroad. Uh, but I continue doing my own thing like on, on the side. Um, and uh, from, from, from that, side like I'm, I'm able to see like this 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 problem that, that I've always kind of like had because on the one hand I am quite familiar with the theory and with what's supposed to do what's supposed to achieve what's supposed to question and then on the other hand I have this terrible um, sort of like anguish that it's really not impacting Mexican uh, the Mexican community because there is there isn't a comprehension. There isn't like a way for us to 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 sort of like understand what queer really is. So we've queered the queer, but it's 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 very complicated. So I I also don't know if I answer your question already. Well, I think what we begin to realize, and I think as we unfold some of this, is what we're really looking at is the limitation of language to some degree, but also the limitation of queerness of queer theory of all these things that we put forward and what I'd like us to find as we go along is sort of find that space of the alternative and see what we can carve out from it because ultimately what we all do and Michael I'll get to you now ultimately what we all do is we all do exist on the margins um, and therefore in this marginal liminal space we're doing something quite different and we're not necessarily working for banks apologies to any bankers who might be here um, <laughs> We're, uh, I don't really apologize, actually. Uh, <laughs> we're not, you know, we're not working in that gay stream world, in the, in the homonormative kind of world, and I think that that's an interesting place from which to operate and to think about how that can be a space of, of change. So let's go to Michael. 
um, who's now running Never Apart, a community center. It's an yeah. arts and culture organization in our in Montreal. Yeah, are located in Montreal, and we're celebrating four years this month. And we have seasonal exhibitions. We do a monthly online magazine. We have a TV show and many different programming directed, not specifically, but heavily to the queer audience. Uh, we have an LGBTQ film series. We do a legend series, many different things. So it's been really awesome to have that opportunity to program these sort of things and be a safe space for all people. Let's go back to what we talked about earlier today around Windsor and yeah. sort of what you did in Windsor and why in terms of the idea of creating a queer platform. Right. What were you doing? I don't know. Why was I in Windsor, Ontario? I had moved there and uh, a bunch of friends and myself were doing different events and fashion shows and we were club kids in Detroit and going to New York where we were heavily influenced by the New York scene. And we were kind of like, why is there not cool stuff here? Like, why is there nothing cool? So we needed to, we realized it was just, it was up to us to create that. So we formed Venus and we started throwing events and theme parties and different art events um, in Windsor, Detroit, including Wiggle, which is our wearable art and performance festival, which is just celebrated 25 years. And Amanda Lepore was our guest host. It was super fun in Montreal. Um, we basically just knew there wasn't stuff like that, so it was a, we took it upon ourselves to create it. And I think we came from that sort of do-it-yourself background where it's like, just do it. <laughs> so that's how we started. Just do it. <laughs> I love it. We haven't just done it for quite some time. No, no, no check mark. <laughs> yeah, take that swoop out. <laughs> um, so I think maybe a nice place to move from here would be around, so these different platforms where we can dig in a little bit more. So I'm gonna bring it back to you. Um, where where do we land? Cindy Lou, right? Um, Luane? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, one of those. Um, <laughs> I'd love you to describe a little bit more because I don't think people know about your music and what you actually do. Oh. <laughs> oh um. Yeah, it's really loud and, and dumb, and uh, none of you should listen to it ever. <laughs> it's great, yeah. Um, I guess people call it noise. Um, some people call it industrial. Some people call it, like, there's a lot of different elements of it. Um, but uh, it's really heavily influenced by punk as well and hardcore and, uh, like, a lot of other things. Um, but... Um, Wait, what was the question? Is that so I just I wanted you to describe it. That's yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. You okay, did yeah. good. That's half. That's half um, the battle. That's yeah. ha we're halfway there. I, I was going to break yeah. it up for you. <laughs> so yeah. then, so then my next question was like, why did you choose that form of noise music um, as a way of expressing yourself? Where did you find the that that made room for you? Well. Um, I was always kind of exposed to alternative alternative media, whatever that means. Because um, my mom is a big old, big old Midwestern hippie. Um, but also just um, seeing uh, Genesis Peorage like friggin' destroy herself and the crowd and then finding out that they were also non-binary was like a whole thing to me. And uh, when I moved to New York, I didn't know that they lived in the fucking Lower East Side. So I had a friend, I have a, oh, I, I delete that. Um, I know them and we played together and that type of thing. But um, just uh, being exposed to Throbbing Crystal and uh, certain elements of the Bro Broken Flag Collective, if, you, if none of you know, that's like uh, Skullflower, Romley, um, uh, Death in June was, I think, a little bit associated with that, but we won't, we won't discuss Death in June tonight. But... Um, all that stuff was like a really heavily heavy influence on me. I also really got into it because my sisters loved pop music, my sisters loved hip hop, and I really hate hated their taste in music. So I just wanted to be as freaking alternative as humanly possible. Um, but it was also the only media that I saw like quote unquote strange queer people um, subverting what I knew as queer from straight people. I felt like it was queer people informing their own sort of thing in a way that incorporated music that you could feel. And I really appreciated that and really wanted to make it. Um, and yeah, I think that's a 
kind of the. Great. Um, one of the things I guess I was thinking about when um, I'm often asked the question when I'm on the other side of them, this this microphone, not the moderator side, I'm often asked about sort of coming out and you know I go back to the early 80s and um, when people ask where I came out, I say I came out um, in Israel in the early 80s in a time in which despite what the Israeli government would like you to believe about queer being you know, everything's so great in Israel and you can be queer here too, not true. Um, but nonetheless, uh, that was a place in which I came out in the early 80s uh, and it was just around the time of the Lebanon War. Um, and the reason I came out was because I was, I was working with a bunch of women who were anti-war and who were uh, anti-occupation and I didn't know what anti-occupation meant. Um, I didn't know anything about Palestine. Um, and so I had a very quick education. And what it taught me was, and a lot of those women who were, you know, the 10 of us who were actually active in Israel-Palestine politics at the time, I think maybe there's 12 now, um, <laughs> a lot of what happened at that time was is that there was a real coming together of the alternative, of the left, and it was groups that came together. So a lot of the women who actually worked in anti-war work who were feminist were also lesbian. And this seemed like a really good idea to me. Um, I thought, just, you know, get your parents really upset all at once. So you go anti-Zionist and <laughs> you go feminist and then you go lesbian. Like, just take it to the wall. <laughs> um, and so, so, <laughs> so what I'm trying to get at here was, is that for that time, you know, it, it was very much about being not just against something, but very much for an alternative community. And what I'd like to shift to is the idea of creating spaces that help create alternative community that don't get um, normalized and don't become part of the regular kind of, that, that work against um, this sort of neoliberalism that seems to be able to consume all of us all the time, maybe even the word queer. So I wondered if you could talk to the, the work of the Schwulis Museum in that regard. Well, let's see. I mean, <coughs> in 2019, obviously, um, homo is not a guarantee for any alternative position or alternative politics anymore, right? Uh, we have the the head of the one of the heads of the IFD, the right wing party in Germany, is a lesbian. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Grinnell, who is the U.S. ambassador um, in in Berlin at the moment. Um, there's a lot to say about that. Anyway, so there's like you know like uh, the, our sexual identity doesn't necessarily bring us together politically anymore, right? Which is uh, very different than say 35 years ago. So the question is, um, how do you respond to that? And um, how do you create a form of community or solidarity that might lead to these spaces uh, that you were naming? And I think one aspect of that, and that's of course a very difficult project, and I think it's a project, uh, a process uh, through which we are going at Schwules Museum is um, to queer, this might sound paradoxical at first uh, sight, to queer LGBTQ communities, <laughs> that is to say, to ask the question about power structures and forces amongst different groups of queer people, you know, about white cis males, um, so there's a question about race and ethnicity, there's a question about class, and um, these are complicated questions, because um, let's just say on an abstract level of analysis, most people would certainly, or would perhaps agree uh, with such an analysis, on the other hand, when you have those people in front of you, for example, at a space like the Schulz Museum, and you talk about white cis uh, uh, male people, it's also becoming very difficult because, for example, the volunteers of the museum are mostly white gay men, but they're also a generation of white gay men uh, that suffered a lot from HIV and AIDS. They're not privileged white gay men. They're really not, you know? So as, as correct as this category is in the abstract, uh, as problematic as it sometimes in the concrete. Just to name one example of where the contradictions and, um, and uh, difficulties are. And on the other hand, there's of course also people, you know, there's gay men that have no feminist interest and there is, uh, you know, feminist lesbians that have a problem with gay male sexuality. So all these problems arise 
in a, in a context as Schwules Museum. And it's very difficult to bring these people together. And especially, say, if the experience of discrimination is not the same for everybody. So how do you get together? How do you create solidarity? You know, And that's, that's of course, a huge question. And I have no answer for that question. The only thing, thing I can say, perhaps, um, for a space like Schwules Museum, that we are trying to respond to these different groups and take into account these different groups of the uh, queer community. And I also want to say that I think um, art can achieve here quite a bit without becoming all too idealistic, I think. That's at least my personal experience uh, with working in a museum. The presence of art uh, can be something really magical, you know, because sometimes then it's not about, say, politics of representation anymore, but it's about the ways in which an artwork moves you, uh, what kind of affects, what kind of desires it triggers, right? And I think this is, for me, uh, this is a route uh, that is interesting and that we should take seriously, you know, how these experiences, for example, aesthetic experiences can bring us together. I don't, I don't want to delve too far into the ideas of, I, I got accused of being universalist when I brought up a similar concept in terms of aesthetics and how it moves us. And of course, you know, I may not be so moved by noise, but I may, I'll try it. Um, <laughs> But I think, the, I think the idea that we can respond to culture um, in ways that bring us together, I, I, certainly, I certainly agree, and I think it's an important point, and thank you for bringing it back to culture, which I think was what we were trying to do here, um, as cultural producers, which is essentially what we all are. We're all somehow involved in the making of culture. Um, maybe we can take it back to Ivan a little bit in terms of cultural production, uh, within terms of, I, I think you mentioned earlier, you know, that you were finding that balance difficult in terms of your own art production um, and what that was like post-PhD being back in Mexico. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about sort of the cultural scene a little bit um, in terms of the alternative cultural scene, uh, queer scene in Mexico. It, it's, it's funny because I'm going to have to go back to, the, to art um, because it's precisely through art that I became aware of like a fracture between the, con the, the contemporary culture scene in Mexico. Um, I think that I would say that there is there is this huge community of artists, not just in Mexico City, but in Latin America, that you know are pretty much aware of and agree and gladly embrace the tenets of queer theory, and you know they call themselves queer, which I think is not the right thing to do. Um, and and you know, I mean, I understand why they would do that, right? Because of institutional support and because you know it it helps you know to be known out there and it gives you a certain visibility, et cetera. And at the same time, you have another group of people that are constantly um, in in in, con in conflict with with this other this first group. Um, there are people that are, are not. They have a problem with calling themselves queer because they believe that this idea of queerness and this idea of queer identity does not really uh, fully embrace or does not really is not really able to comprehend the nature of the Latin American um, difference, right? So it's where queer becomes like a colonial tool to, to, to sort of like understand sexualities that have a total different political context, total different social context that, you know, has to do a lot with race, with, you know, um, capitalism and, 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 you know, everything that Latin American thought sort of has sort of, sort of kind of like put forward um, that it's really, you know, not making queer like really exist in, in, in the territory. So um, what they have done is call themselves, I mean, queer, but what they, they've taken the, the, the phonetic um, uh, expression. So, you know, as in queer, it's Q-U-E-E-R, and now it's uh, C-U-I-R, where, where it's kind of like, they're sort of like making like a Spanish um, version of, of the, of the ang anglicism there. And, um, and and they're trying to understand like what uh, what new ways of being queer from a Latin American perspective can be put forward in order to understand this sort of like idiosyncratic differences that make their own differences and their own desires sort of like you know 
more contemporary and more visible out there. So I, the balance for me, it's just sort of like trying to kind of like be in the middle. I'm not trying to be a moderator or anything. I'm just trying to be an arbiter of anything. But just, just I mean, to me personally, I mean, I, I don't think that I am queer as with a Q or with a, with a C. I mean, I, I think I'm usually in the limbo. I go back and forth. Um, like I usually, you know, joke with friends. Wasn't like I'm usually very homonormative um, because it helps me sort of like, gain access to certain knowledge and to certain, you know, expressions. Um, but at the same time, I am aware of that privilege, if you want to call it, right? So um, it's 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 really interesting, but uh, I, I still don't have an answer for for that. Your community, uh, sorry, your cultural center, Michael, um, is called Never Apart. It's true. <laughs> and I just wondered if you could kind of tell us about like why the name Never Apart. Um, you know, it obviously provokes always together, um, which we know we are not, as we've discovered. So why Never Apart? Where did that come from? Well, our founder, Dax Da Silva, is who came up with the name Never Apart. And there's many reasons as to why it's called that. One being, um, we are separated. We're separated, a lot of us live like this on our phone, so it's a way to bring people together from all walks of life. A lot of queer people are also separated from any spiritual connection um, through the institution of religion, obviously, and not being accepted, so that was another reason. Um, so many reasons, but that's basically to bring people together. We wanted to create a space where you know folks can actually interact with one another be inspired by art, create dialogue, and never be apart. <laughs> Sometimes we need to be apart. Uh, <laughs> it's tr I mean, it's true, but I mean, you know, in a global. No, no, absolutely. You know and I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump off from there because I want to open it up to you guys. Um, but I want to, I want to sort of leave this as a thought with you, and then maybe the panel also wants to engage a little bit. Uh, but I'm, I, I'm. I'm always very concerned, I guess, with sort of where are we now? Um, we have a very particular difficult cultural moment, difficult political moment, um, in which we're seeing sort of the dissipation of liberal democracy in any case. Um, and we're seeing, therefore, a resurgence of intolerance, a resurgence of hate, um, which is claiming its own form of democracy, uh, saying this is the will of the other people, of the populace that doesn't feel like they've been heard or listened to and doesn't really feel they need to make room for minorities, minority rights, uh, anything to do with difference per se. So we are in a what seems to me like a, an extreme and becoming much more violent moment. Um, and I'm just, I, I felt it much more acutely, I think, in Europe than I did here. Um, but we have an election coming up, so don't, uh, don't get too comfortable. Um, because I think we're going to see something very similar in Canada. And I just wondered if we wanted to talk about, I mean, I guess my whole thought about why I, you know, answered the call when Utah said, will, will you moderate this, was to think about this as a space of thinking about alternatives. And queer, we can debate back and forth whether, in fact, it is or isn't an alternative space. I'd like to think of it still as elastic enough to have that space for alternative. But I'd also like us to think together about this particular moment and our way out of it and where queer can play a role in that, if that's... I know that's a big task, but basically I'm just asking you to put down the rules for evolution. It's not hard. <laughs> Where do we go from here? So I invite you to ask the panelists questions um, about what they do, about their practice more so. I feel like I've just begun. I've just gleaned a little bit. We've heard a little bit about the conflicts that arise um, within queer communities. And I wonder if you have some, some other questions. a picture to also educate people about these problems that young people are facing and everything. But we also feel that sometimes 
they are using these characters in a way of like just as it was said before, to appear more open, to, to, to give us this feeling that we are all now super accepting when this, like the reality is probably not like that, the high school is probably not like that. Do you ever feel like this mainstream thing was taken too far? I don't personally think it's taken too far. I think that it's good to have representation in any way. When I was growing up, there wasn't any. So it's like the fact that there is Glee or you know most sitcoms and television shows have queer characters um, and that continues to grow. I think that's actually a really good thing. I mean, of course, the pendulum swings and there's good and bad, there's no absolutes, but I think it's a good thing. But I, th I think it's a double-edged sword. I mean, I, I think it's, it's, it's good that there's visibility, it's good that there's representation, but at the same time, you know, the extent to which these representations reinforce stereotypes that are harmful to the community that do not allow that community to question these and you know to move forward in terms of representation and in terms of desire and difference and et, et cetera you know you know that's when i have a problem like you know like I, it, I, it makes me angry when people say oh Ru rupaul is very queer as in it's very questioning no, not really i mean i mean in my opinion you can debate me <laughs> um but uh but but yeah i mean it, it's it's good i mean it's good that people are getting exposed to that it's just i think the alternative or or the the option there should be you know like how true or how you know democratic are these representations that's that's a totally different question my my answer is probably a little bit similar to yours uh, where i would say the question of homo or transphobia is becoming more more complicated and more subtle so it's not so much about being represented or not but um you know the ways of representations can be in themselves still quite trans or homophobic for sure. And uh, obviously it also is not um, a substitute or it, it certainly doesn't replace, say, um, a queer culture in a, yeah, in a different way, in a, in a you know, a queer, a queer made queer culture. So a queer culture that, that does not cater to some uh, form of consumption or mainstream TV stations but um, that is in a different way in touch with, let's just say, the life worlds and experiences of queer people. I think <laughs> I agree with um, the, I agree with everyone. I also, like, growing up, the only black queer person I ever saw was fucking RuPaul. And I know people that have competed on Drag Race, and that's why I have averse um, opinions about RuPaul. But... Let's just gloss over that. <laughs> Let's just gloss over that. Um, I think that um, queer representation is essential because there are lots of queer people in the fucking world. My issue with it is, I, personally, I work with a lot of, I work with a very diverse group of queer people. The, la the last music video I did was like predominantly queer people working behind the scenes with me. We like came up with the concept together and it was like a great thing and everyone seems to love that music video. Um, when I look at a lot of... Um, Specifically with Pose, the reason why the show Pose is so good is because there are trans writers, there's a trans executive producer, um, some of the directors of some of the episodes are also queer or trans or, or gay of some sort, and there are trans stars in it because it's about trans people. So it's, it makes sense when it's done that way, um, but more often than not, what I see when I look at things, I'm, I'll, this is also coming from this crazy person so like take take what I say with a grain of salt, um, but my whole thing is fuck me up. I want to take me out of where I am and put me where you are. So I want to see a lot of different kinds of people interacting. I always used to say when I was growing up, I don't because like, my mom loved Will and Grace when I came out. All I out of nowhere I was like, of course you like Will and Grace. Thanks, mom. Um, <laughs> but um, I always used to say the only like sitcom I'm I'm going to be interested in is a like Dominican uh, trans woman in the Bronx who's like a graphic designer who is not very good but like has a job and she's happy about that and like yeah and <laughs> it makes music and like the music isn't good and like three people show up to her shows and like you know I think that would be hilarious but like is that ever going to happen is NBC going to put that on TV no but there's a lot of Dominican trans women in the Bronx, girl. Like, come on, like, make it happen. But they're not going to, you know what I mean? Um, so yeah, that's what 
<laughs> can I just add one thing? Uh, it just occurred to me, you know, like uh, with all the criticism of, say, uh, stereotypical representation in North American entertainment, uh, still, this is so much more advanced in comparison to television culture in Germany, <laughs> where we have hardly any uh, gay, lesbian, trans characters at all, right? So that's also something we should keep in mind. Yeah, I mean, I, I think to go back to your question, it's a great question because I think it's exactly the complexity, right? But I think really what we're looking at and what we're talking about is what happens with mass mediaization. You know, so yes, I think it's important for characters to be in, you know, visible and, you know, even RuPaul, right? To have, you know, the, a black drag queen on, uh, in, in this major way um, in a U.S. media market is important. But ultimately, the mediaization that happens after the fact um, and the reason for it and where we take it, those are the things that start to become the problem. I'm reminded of uh, the 1984 film by Lizzie Borden called Born in Flames and just how radical that was at the time um, about a bunch of black women who take over a radio station after a failed socialist revolution in America and are trying to put out a message and trying to get people sort of back on track. Um, and that was one of the first representations of, and some of them were queer, and that was like some of the first representations of black lesbian identity. Um, but it was also framed within the idea of revolution. You know, is that what we're gonna see now? Probably not so much. <laughs> so I think it's about what we're saying with these characters too that matters. Other questions? Yeah. Um, yeah. conservative, uh, limiting, oppressive um, entities. I, 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 I feel these are two different questions. Uh, so there's the question about the institution. And uh, you know, if I talk about the history of the Schules Museum, so the Schules Museum has been a project that didn't get any uh, financial support basically for 25 years was only um, supported through volunteers. And once in a while, there was maybe an exhibition or a research project that got public funding. Uh, 10 years ago, we started getting uh, so-called institutional funding. So our rent, our salaries, utilities are covered by half a million euros that we get each year from the city of Berlin. And this is for granted. So you know, this is the institutional support that we get, um, plus you know, additional money for, for exhibitions. Um, all right, so the question is, has this uh, changed the place and in what ways, right? It's hard to say, it's very difficult to say because on the one hand there is, I mean, there's no direct control. So the Senate of Berlin is not checking on us or spying on us, you know, what we're doing. I mean, we have to report uh, financially and also give them an account of the exhibitions we did, the, the, the kind of audience that we've reached, all of that. But um, in terms of content, they pretty much let us do what we want to do. I guess the question is more, you know, if the Schwules Museum starts corporations like this one with the Goethe Institute, for example, right? Uh, that's, that's a similar question. So what happens if you are entering the cultural arena and you have to make your cause somehow communicatable to other cultural institutions? What is getting lost in the, on the way? Um, I can describe these things. I, I think it's very difficult to come down here with an answer. Let's just say, perhaps in the context of Berlin, that with the, with the Senate of the city of Berlin, which has been run by the Social Democrats for the past, I don't know how many years, more than 20, we've had a very good experience. And we've had a gay mayor of the city of Berlin, Klaus Overreit, who was in the Social Democratic Party, who supported the museum very much. And now we have a um, secretary of culture from the Linke, Klaus Lederer, who's also openly gay, who supports us very much. So in that sense, uh, I would say it has helped us. That would be my answer for the question of the institution. The question of um, queer in a way that is not describing an identity. Um, I think that's a very, very important question. And I think uh, without, without, without this question of what does 
queer means beyond identity politics, the whole project of queer becomes meaningless. Um, at the very same time, it's very difficult to pinpoint. You know, I was talking about aesthetic experiences before. You could also talk about sexual experiences. You could talk about other bodily experiences that somehow bring you beyond the limits of your body, right? So this, this for me, are the, this is the playground for queerness in a way that does not um, support identity politics, but creates a perhaps communal experience in the sense of queer beyond that. Well, I mean, I guess with Never Apart, we are technically an institution, but we're not the same sort of institution. And luckily, we're funded privately by the founder, who's done really well in the tech world. And he wanted to create, his intentions were to create a space that was safe and that we had that freedom. So for us, um, it's a little different. Safe is a really interesting thing, because um, you brought it up earlier, Michael. And you know, it's something that the community bandies about a lot, the idea of safe space. Um, and I've always been, I don't know, it's always sort of crawled up my back, the idea of safe space, and maybe I'm just a grumpy old lesbian, but uh, <laughs> most places in the world aren't safe for me, never have been safe, um, and I, I just, I'm not even sure what the idea of safe space actually means in the sense of maybe it's a space where you don't get beat up granted. Definitely. Um, that's good. Uh, nobody's, no, I'm not against that. Uh, <laughs> But I, I wonder about this larger idea of safe space, if it's one of those things that's kind of defanged us um, as a movement in which, like I'm thinking specifically back to noise and back to, you know, being in a space that has a little bit more edge and a little bit more grit. And maybe, maybe what I'm trying to say is, is that sometimes we need to sort of get out of our comfort zones um, and that safety, and I'm not criticizing at all, I'm just thinking about it out loud as a space, the idea of safe has kind of defanged us as a movement. And when you talk about that, I was thinking, I remember when uh, Ron Athey did uh, um, uh, a performance many years ago in the 80s, um, in which there was blood and urine and you know the community in America went hysterical because this was during the time of AIDS. And of course, the performer that he was working with was HIV negative, everything had been checked out before, but it was just the concept. And this was a very frightening time, of course, one had to be sensitive, but there wasn't, you know, the, the idea of that wasn't safe space was bandied about um, quite a lot. And I think we're now at a time in which everything has to be really safe, <laughs> um, which doesn't leave a lot of room for difference. And I just wondered if you had some thoughts about safe space. I don't have any thoughts about that at all. <laughs> no, I, I totally agree. I feel like specifically like the early shows that I used to play back home in Wichita, um, where I'm from, um, the idea of DIY was already foreign anyway. So the fact that we were, and when when I started performing my music, it was like almost a decade after I had started making it. So it was like a whole thing. And I didn't know that I had become an urban legend in my, my city. And when I started playing, I was just like, they, they were actually surprised that I was like 5'8 and like 120. They were just like, yeah, dream crush your wallet. It's like, yeah, yeah, girl, like let's do sound check. Like let's come on. Um, but um, I understand the necessity of identity politics and that sort of thing, but I do feel like, I don't know, like understanding queer history to the degree that I do, um, which isn't, is, isn't very far. Um, our elders were some tough motherfuckers. They went through a lot of shit that I like, if I'm I'm scared of people bumping into me on the subway, like let alone someone throwing a Molotov cocktail at me because I'm gay. You know what I'm saying? So like, there I I understand like why those things are necessary and why spaces like the ones that I tend to play more often than not need to be um, labeled as a queer space that is as an open space and that type of thing. But I hate people tiptoeing around me. Don't tiptoe around me. I am, despite my stage presence, I'm a very, like, I'm filled with peanut butter, and you can say hi to me, and we can talk. 
we could gab you can you know so like i feel like when we start to do the safe space thing it 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 inhibits crowd interaction and uh, for me personally i i really thrive on crowd interaction mainly because i don't ever go out because the world is shit so like the the few times that i avail myself to the general public is to play and express myself and I'm the way I approach it is you paid to come here. You know what I'm saying? You paid to see a show. I'm playing with these amazing musicians. Take advantage of that. Take t- there's tangibility there that you wouldn't have any other time. So like m- make your presence known. Like I I want to see you. I want to s- like you know what I'm saying? Like and the kind of music that I make is very interactive and it's very intense. So when I get the opposite of that um, I usually akin it to the fact that they're um, they're here because they're queer, not because they're interested in the work, and it that, that really makes me frustrated because I don't know we we don't have that many spaces anyway, and when we create our own spaces, and you don't take the opportunity to sort of like grab a hold of that and like cherish it and like oh this is mine and I'm so happy because I don't have this anywhere else. It's just like then. What you paid ten dollars, girl? You paid ten dollars at the dough. <laughs> what you doing? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I think I, I think I answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I add something? To sure, that? So, please. please. I, I mean, I I very much agree with your. On the one hand, I very much agree with your skepticism about the politics or culture of safe spaces. However. It's also very complicated. For example, at the museum, um, if safe spaces is about the question what you can show and what you cannot show, or who feels offended by what kind of representation. I mean, um, we also are, we have an educational purpose. We want school classes to come to our museum. We think that's important work. Um, so what do we do with the pornographic material? What are we going to like, you know, just block this one room, or are we pretending to show queer life in a different way because it must be somehow accessible for school children or what's what's the strategy here, right? Just one example of where the limit of the criticism of safe spaces is. The other um, thing that just came to my mind, one of the wonderful things of working in a, a schwules or queerist uh, museum is of course um, that you're working together with other queer people and you understand where they're coming from. And one of the discussions I'm always having with my colleague uh, Birgit, who um, curated here the show, Queer is German Folk, is the, is the fight about the meaning of public sex. And one of the things that I understood is for, for many, I'm not saying for everybody, you know, there's homophobia and of course also for gay men. However, I think for many gay men, the uh, experience of, uh, of the public and sexuality is associated with adventure and excitement. Whereas for women, straight and lesbian, the idea of sexuality in public is uh, associated with danger. And that's a fundamental, fundamentally different experience where lesbians theoretically understand the idea of public gay sex, but in fact have no access to it because they are um, structurally, the lesbian and, 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 and female experience is somehow um, um, brought to the space of where sexuality is is uh, always a question of danger as well. And I think, you know, this is just one of the, one, one of example of how the discourse on safe spaces means very different things for different uh, queer groups. Agreed. I mean, we have an interesting historical moment, opportunity here uh, to remember uh, a little Toronto history and where sort of in the early 80s or sort of mid 80s, I guess, really, early 90s, actually. Sorry, I'm just going through this in my head, early 90s, um, we started to have kind of much more women were seeking um, uh, more public sex, more kind of like, uh, I think there was a desire to kind of have more of a boy scene in women's bars. Um, And so we started to develop these clubs uh, in the early 90s that were much more sex forward. And this was a big challenge to a lesbian community, a lot of it that came out of a feminist moment, a lot of it that talked about danger around rape, around all these other things that women um, very much experienced and were sort of, was part of their world, and yet there was this sort of other desire um, coming forward in the lesbian community in the 90s to kind of 
break through some of that. Um, so there were a couple of clubs. There was the Boom Boom Room. There was, um, later on, as I mentioned, there was uh, Pussy Palace, which came about. And Pussy Palace was an attempt to have a woman's bath, a woman's bathhouse, um, in which you could walk around naked, you could have sex if you wanted, you could not have sex if you didn't want, uh, but it was supposed to be a safe space for women um, to experiment a little bit more with the idea of public sex. And of course what happened was is the police raided it um, because our 1969 uh, decriminalization of homosexuality under a Trudeau elder actually didn't decriminalize homosexuality in Canada, and we can have a conversation about that if you're interested, um, and left many things undone. So one of, the, one of the results was, of course, it was the operation of a body house in terms of Pussy Palace, and I think there was a lot of arrests done on vagrancy. Um, a lot of the women fell under the laws of vagrancy. Do you remember any of it? No? Okay. Sometimes I look to my friend Corvin, who knows everything, but not that clearly. Uh, so, um, so that was an interesting result, and I think, I think it just kind of crushed it between that and the bad attitude trials that happened here in Canada around censorship of uh, lesbian pornography. That got shut down, too. So I think those three things that happened just within the Toronto community kind of <laughs> just stamped out any idea of, you know, women and sort of lesbians trying to explore sexuality in alternative ways. Um, and I think this was all happening at the same time in terms of homonormativity, where the male community was becoming also a lot more family oriented and more, you know, homonormative in terms of saying, it's like, oh yeah, those are those gay men, but that's not us. <laughs> um, we're your poster boys. So I think those things have kind of contributed to a very different moment in our in our history in which both safe space, while it's you know significant, important, and does very important things, at the same time I've just sort of brought it up as a, a little bit of tension um, in terms of what it also didn't allow for. Uh, there's no single lesbian bar left in Berlin uh, at this point. As far as I know, I don't think there's a bar here either. Does anybody know differently? There is not. There is not. Or Montreal. Vancouver. I was actually, I was actually going to point out um, when I played in Berlin last. I played in a, a venue called Suela, and um, some friends of mine who live in Berlin um, uh, were there, and we're like, oh, we're hanging out and everything. I don't know anything about Berlin as that much, except for Berghain and like a few other things, which is really sad. Um, but they told me that there is like a sex dungeon below Cantina. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Uh, there's like a sex dungeon below Cantina, the stage, oh, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Right, right. And f is you mean, it? You mean the laboratory? Yes, 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 yes. 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 It's a wonderful place. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Only on Thursday nights. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, but um. When you're bartending. Yeah. <laughs> but they they told me that um it's men only, uh, yes. except for one day a week, and then it's all genders, which is fascinating to me. Is that true? I think it's always male only, but there's another club, there's a Kit Kat club, um, which has hosted six parties for the past 20 years or so, and they have they have mixed parties, but Laboratory doesn't, I think. Wow. I just wanted, okay, I just wanted to. Don't you love how this always comes back to sex? <laughs> oh, yes, honey, you know. <laughs> in, in, in Mexico City, I don't think there's a lesbian bar, um, but there are six, oriented places for lesbians i know like it's called like, like you know like the dark rooms for men there, and i think there's one for women it's called the, the lavender room but it's it's a dark place uh, like a dark room place uh, not as in a dark place and <laughs> and, um, and and i think and i think of like recently i just just read something about um, because the Me Too movement is very much alive right now in Mexico mm -hmm. in Mexico City, so I think that what uh, lesbians, like radical lesbians um, collectives, are doing is sort of like creating spaces where women and not necessarily queer women can come together and talk about their experiences and 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 like but party, you know, in, in kind of like a festive environment. Mm -hmm. So that, that's that's and they're specifically. Uh, like stopping like men from coming in, so they just want to say is, this is just a women only space. Right. Mm -hmm. I was just gonna say that is an indicator to the world. We're, what we're discussing right now is an indicator to the world that female sexuality is the strongest force known to man. Mm -hmm. 
Because you see how the government is trying to inhibit it. Uh, inhibit it. They're trying to shut it down. Straight, f- femme presenting, mass presenting, all that. It's just like very, it's very apparent to me. It's I have three sisters and this is why I'm like, <sighs> so frustrating. Because I think one of my sisters is gay. And I'm like really happy about it. And I want her to tell me. She also lives in Texas, of all places. So I'm like, I want her to have a bar to go to if she is gay. You know what I'm saying? But I feel like she's not going to tell me, of all <laughs> me of all people. Like, come on, girl. Like, But I just, yeah, it's really interesting what we're discussing right now. Because in New York, there are, it's a very similar uh, situation to, um, actually, a lot of, like, bars on the coast in America where it's, like, they're gay bars and then they have a lesbian night. Hmm. It's just like, like, mo- like honestly, most. I of think my f- the cubby hole still exists in New York. I think I it's think like the one place in the world that still exists. I think um, I think it became a gay bar, unfortunately. But oh. th- I think they have like, yeah, <laughs> right, right, Howie. which is so uh, the yeah. cubby hole. Yeah. No. It's, All uh, right. With yeah. that disappointment. <laughs> um, <laughs> All things fall apart forever. Uh, what I'd like to say is is that I, I thank you all. It's in terms of the idea, what, what I hope we managed to achieve was the idea of holding complexity by tearing apart some of these ideas that we think we know what they mean until we actually start to dissect it a little bit. Um, I think we all have our hands full with trying to sort of work around these things both respectfully um, but understand simultaneously that these things can be very complicated. And I guess what I would hope for more than anything is that if I had to go take home from here, it would be moving forward with complexity will be our way out. Understanding our history, knowing these things will be our way out of these kind of mono voices that seem to be taking over culture at the moment. So I don't know if you have last words, but Uwe? (laughs) Sorry. Stonewall. <laughs> well, Stonewall for me, um, I went to Stonewall 25, and that definitely changed my life. And it was a very positive experience and an eye opening experience. And, um, you know, was a monumental moment. So I'm excited to celebrate there next week as well for Stonewall 50. I have a story about that, actually. Um, is anyone familiar with Broadway Bears? Um, so I went this year, um, and uh, um, I went with my partner and t- his two uh, straight friends. So that gives you an idea of what the situation was. Um, and the theme was, like, aviation. Um, but I, I don't know. Like... They, at the end, the whole, like, run through where, like, there were little skits of, like, the two older gays and the two younger gays, and they're flying, and they're like, oh, oh, your luggage is my luggage. You have a jockstrap. I have a whip. (laughs) That was, like, the run through, and it was, like, until, it was, like, a two-hour thing, and at the end, there was, like, a very teeny thing that was, like, uh, the older gays had said, yeah, it's the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall riots. And uh, the two younger gays go, oh, the Stonewall in that old gay bar. And then they were like, what? You don't know what Stonewall, right? The, the Stonewall riots were? And they were like, oh, well, it's just an old gay bar we never go to. And it's just like, no, you need to know your f***ing history. I don't know why I'm censoring myself now. But um, <laughs> uh, that ship has sailed. Uh, but they spent... This is like a two-hour production. If you're familiar with, I don't know if, if you're not familiar with Broadway Bears, it's a uh, charity event for HIV and AIDS. That this year they got, I think, two point one million dollars in donations. Um, and uh, yeah, the whole thing, the whole thing is it's like a strip tease from like Broadway performers, and they're all um, volunteering, and it's like a whole thing. But they spent a good. Two minutes, if that, talking about Stonewall. The significance of it, they showed they showed Marsha B. Johnson's picture. They saw uh, Sylvia Rivera's picture. And then they flashed to a striptease to like some new pop song that I can't even fucking remember because I don't listen to that shit. And it, it, it was like, 
everyone was like in their feelings about it. It's like, oh, Stonewall, yay, money. And it just like, they just kind of swept over it. And I feel like a lot of um, gay people in general, not even just young gay people, um, don't really know the significance of that. And it's really painful to me thinking of that because I found out about Stonewall from my mother before she knew that I was... um, <laughs> and um the way she, the way that she prefaced it was um that she's always known trans people in her life and she's always known that if you're a queer person going through specifically middle america that you're going to have to learn how to fight you're going to have to learn how to defend yourself and you're going to have to learn learn how to defend your brothers and your sisters and your thems and your theys and uh she lived in near we where i grew up is near a railroad track and when my mom had uh, purchased the property, it was like her from her aunts that she purchased it. Um, there was a uh, very questionable bar where um, the girls went to work. And if a, if a male had gone into the bar and like someone said, no, I'm not interested, they would, the, the men would like usually chase the women down into the alley and try to kill them. And she would always like look, look behind her fucking house and see like a bunch of people like fighting all the time. And not know what the hell was going on. So she started going to the bar and got, got to know the girls. It was there. You know what I'm saying? So, like, it's, I don't know. It's really interesting. This, that, like, Stonewall is, like, a thing, obviously. But there were so many Stonewalls in America at that time. And, um, yeah, it's. I think it's really important that we know why that's significant. And why it it really affects us now, still. <laughs> Um, and yeah, that was kind of, I, I, I'm, that's my Stonewall moment. I blabs. So let me shut up. Maybe, maybe just a brief comment about how Stonewall traveled the Atlantic or not, because interestingly, uh, well, we had, you know, the decriminalization of homosexuality in Germany also took place in 1969. I mean, the first step of, uh, decriminalization. Um, but Stonewall, and of course, we didn't have social media, we didn't have the internet, nothing like that. So Stonewall didn't hit Germany with any kind of immediacy. Um, but, um, you know, what the histori- historiography says is more that in Germany, it was not so much Stonewall in itself, but actually um, a film which triggered the gay and lesbian rights movement, which is uh, Rosa von Braunheims, nicht der Homosexuelle ist pervers, sondern uh, die Gesellschaft... Um, Gosh, how is that? <laughs> die Gesellschaft, die ihn, I'm sorry, I cannot, anyway, so it's not the, it's not the homosexual that is the pervert, but, uh, the homo, the society that makes him. Yeah, so that was a, a film made by Rosa von Braunheim in 1970. That was a movie that traveled, um, uh, campuses across West Germany. And pretty much after the screening of this movie, uh, gay rights group were founded. So this is what brought the dynamics together in the, in the West German context very much um, removed from Stonewall as an event on the one hand. On the other hand, strangely, and I don't know why that actually is, you know, uh, perhaps that in Germany, gay pride is called Christopher Street Day. <laughs> so CSD, yeah? So we have a very specific signifier to the location, to the street of the Stonewall event, although most people probably in Germany would not be able to say why it's called what Christopher Street Day means, but it's still like the in the media, the official term, CSD. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, like, I don't like, I don't think it. Like, I know about it because of research and everything, but I don't, I don't think that it has that, you know, sort of like importance in in terms of liberation for Mexico because it was. I mean, it's as I said, it's a completely different context. Um, I I think that in Mexico, it's it's it was just a particular moment in time, like in the seventies, when you kind of like the community sort of like because they they saw that other places were. Um, you know, parading and demanding the right, the rights, and you know, fighting for you know visibility, etc. That they started doing the same, but we didn't have like a riot moment, and it, it was not necessarily Stonewall. It was it was more about the idea of oh, what well, the people are doing it. Let's just do that, you know, for for our own community as well. So it, it's not necessarily Stonewall per se. I said mine, but I mean, Stone. you know, there's there's history, obviously, about Stonewall. There's different things that have happened before Stonewall. That's sort of where a lot of people, you know, were celebrating that. And it's sort of maybe the start of 
when things kind of globally started changing. So I think it's great to know our, our history that way. I, I think 69 is such an important marker for so many things. Um, but, you know, and I think we all have our own kind of little associations and fantasies about 69, summer of love, you know, basically anti-Vietnam, uh, so many sort of small revolutions around the world that obviously some led to disappointment, some led to massive change. Um, so I thank you for thinking of that and reminding us why we're in fact here. <laughs> um, and uh, I thank you all for listening to us gab on. Um, hopefully you found that space of alterity that I was looking for anyway. Um, and I think that's it for me. <laughs> yes? Thank you.